In this video I will be talking about aerodynamics with a focus on lift and drag forces for objects. So I have separated aerodynamics into two videos. This first one I will be talking about individual object such as how does a wing work. And then in the blade element momentum model video I will be talking about how do you apply it to a wind turbine. So this particular video will not focus on the wind turbine itself, it's just the basics and the stuff that you may have seen in the previous fluid mechanics course if you're taking a basic course. So let's start by some repetition. What is causing forces on objects? And in fluid mechanics we have two sources. The first is pressure. And pressure is acting in the normal direction of a cross section. And the main source for pressure when we're talking about lift and drag is the flow velocity. So here we should think about Bernoulli's equation, which states that there's a quadratic relationship between the pressure and the flow velocity. Let's now assume that we have an object. And on this object, the flow is coming in from the left. This flow will now cause pressure over the whole object. And to get the force, we need to see how the pressure varies over the surface. So to calculate the force, we integrate the pressure over the surface. And the pressure is acting in a negative normal direction. So in minus n0. The next source is the shear stress. And shear stresses are caused by friction forces in the fluid. So now it's the viscosity that's causing it. And we should notice that we see that we have two different directions for this surface. And in practice we actually have a fully three-dimensional tensor that have nine components. And now if you want to calculate the force due to shear stress, First we can draw the shear stress in the figure, and the shear stress will be acting in the direction of the flow velocity. So now we need to integrate this force over the area, which is given by this general expression, where the tau here is the full tensor. Now the question is, what will give the biggest contribution? Is it shear stress or pressure when we're talking about the drag force. So let's take an example. The flow comes from the left, we put an object in the way. For this object, we can start by checking the area. We have a very big area that the pressure can act on in the direction of the flow. But we have a very small area that the shear stress can act on. From this simple argument, we can claim that, in this case, it's the pressure that is giving the drag force. Now, let us turn the object. And now we have a very big area that the shear stress can act on. And we have, but we have a very small area that the pressure can act on. So now we can make the assumption, shear stress should give the largest contribution in this particular case, if it's thin enough. Okay, let's make it harder. What gives the largest contribution now? Well, to analyze this, I want to look at how the flow field actually looks. So here we have two examples. In the pressure case, we see that the flow basically goes around and it leaves here and it creates a big region with low flow losses behind it. In the shear stress, well, the flow goes just next to it and it affects a relatively small region of the flow. Now we can introduce a control volume. So you draw a control volume around both objects. Then we know from the momentum equation that the force should correspond to the change in flow velocity. 
So if we change the flow of loss a lot, we get a big force. If we do not change the flow of loss at all, we don't, do not have any force at all. And here we can see that in the left case, we do get a big contribution to how we change the flow velocity, while in the right case, it's a very minor contribution. Hence, we should have a much bigger force in the pressure case than in the shear stress case here. So now we can look at how does the flow look behind this cubical object. Well, we can make the assumption that the flow field looks a bit similar to the pressure dominated case, that we get a big area behind it we have to decrease the flow velocity. So you can make a decent assumption that this area and this area is about the same. And it would give about the same force on the two objects. So we can now make the conclusion that this uh, cubic case is much more similar to a pressure case if you look at the flow velocities. Hence it should be pressure dominated. And the shear stress should be a very small contribution to this object. And the fact is that for most objects, pressure will give a much larger contribution than the shear stress. I should also mention that what determines the pressure is mainly the shape of the object. Therefore, drag from pressure is also called form drag, just because this depends on the form of the object. And drag from shear stress is sometimes called viscous drag or friction drag because it's caused by friction forces. Let's move on. And now we're just going to go through the definition of the lift and drag. So what we have is basically one force on an object. Look here, we have one aerodynamic force F. Then we split it into two components. And then we call one component the drag force, which is a component pointing backward. And the other component is the lift force pointing up. And this distance of the wing is called the chord length. Then to calculate this, we have this general equation. The drag force is one half times the drag coefficient times the density area and velocity squared. So how do we get this equation? Well, the derivation is actually just from dimensional analysis. We can see that it has to be on this shape to get the correct units on both sides. But if you want to know a bit more how it appears, you can think first about Bernoulli. Here we see that pressure varies as one half times density and velocity squared. And then the force is pressure integrated over the area. So there we get our area. So it's basically these terms we have in the expression, and then we have the drag coefficient. So what we have done is that we have put all the complicated behavior into the drag coefficient. And then we can say that if we know the drag coefficient, we know the lift force. But the challenge is that it's very hard to determine the drag coefficient. Also, if you want to calculate lift forces, it's the same equation, but we use the lift coefficient instead of the drag coefficient. And so remember, these equations are from dimensional analysis. So we can choose any area, we can actually choose any velocity, and then we put all the complicated behavior into the coefficient. I also want to stress the direction definitions. Drag is parallel with the flow, lift is perpendicular with the flow. So now comes the question, how do we def define the area in the equation? Because we can choose any area we want. And now we want to choose the area that affects the results as much as possible. So what is the most important area for the force? That's the area we need to plug into this equation to make it as we have as little dependence into the coefficient as possible. So for the pressure, or the pressure dominated case, the most logical area is the area I've drawn here. 
So it's the area that is visible to the, to the flow, the front area. For the shear stress dominated case, then it should logically be the area that the shear stress is acting on. And when we have both shear stress and pressure, we should use the area of the most important force. And that's the pressure force. So therefore, we usually use the projected area when we define the area in this equation, especially for drag force calculations. But what do we do here? We have an airfoil. It's not as obvious right now which area is the best area to use. But the area we're going to use is actually this cord. And the motivation for this is, well, we have two reasons. First, for an airfoil, we want to get the lift force, not the drag force. And this is the area that is important for the lift force. And second, when we have an airfoil, we are going to change the angle of the airfoil relative to the wind. And it's very practical in the equation to have a fixed area defined. Therefore, we use the chord length which always is fixed, instead of trying the projected area that faces the wind, because that area could change while chord is constant. Our next concept is potential flow. And this is a concept that is not that good for drag, but it's very useful when you describe lift later on. The concept is like this. If we assume in viscid flow and irrotational flow, so we assume that viscosity is so low that it can be neglected, and that we do not have rotation in the flow. The motivation for this assumption is as follows. You can prove that you cannot create rotation in the middle of the fluid. It can only be created at the boundaries, and then due to viscosity. Hence, people assume that it should be possible to neglect the rotation. And if you neglect rotation and viscosity, now you can write the velocity as a potential. So this is just pure math. That if you have a rotational free field, you can write it as a potential. It applies for all vector fields. Then we insert it into the incompressible continuity equation. Now plug in this velocity, and you see that you get the Laplace equation. And Laplace equation, this is an equation that is easy to solve. Among the partial differential equations, it's probably the easiest one to solve. So this is something people did a long time ago, back before we had computers actually work on. There's a problem with this solution though. This is what you would get if you solve it for a cylinder. Now, let's add in four points. So you have points A, B, C, D. What is the pressure in these points? Well, Bernoulli's equation states that you have the direct relationship between pressure and velocity if you follow a streamline. And since the flow is following the streamline, this is okay. Now Bernoulli states that we have the same velocity for each point. And same velocity then has to mean we have the same pressure. We have the same pressure directly from symmetry. The force is zero. And you can always create four points distributed like this, that you get symmetry between them, so all the pressure forces cancel. So, basically for this cylinder, we get that the total force from pressure is zero. If you want to motor it in, in a different way, you can say that, define a control volume around the object. Now the force should correspond to the change in flow velocity. And since the flow velocity looks the same at inlet as at outlet, there cannot be any force. So, general conclusion. 
If the flow is irrotational, the flow will follow the surface and the drag force due to pressure is zero. So this is still an important result to think about. Because if we can manage to create a flow that follows the surface, you will get zero force due to pressure. And this applies to any shape, it's not just a cylinder. Any shape, as long as the flow lines are following the surface, you get zero pressure contribution, mathematically. The question now is, what's wrong with this solution? Because we all know that we do have a drag force on the cylinder. And we do have a drag force due to pressure. It's just not friction. So even if you have very low viscosity, you still get a significant drag force on a cylinder. So how do we explain it? Well, the solution came basically by Ludwig Prantl in 1904. And it did show why you do get drag even if the viscosity is really small. So the basic thing we can say is that the limit when the viscosity goes to zero is not this zero viscosity solution we got from potential flow. So we get a different solution with very, very low viscosity. So what you're going to do when you do this um, boundary layer, you're going to split the flow into two parts. So these two regions, what we have is that one region is very close to the object and this close region we do affect the flow velocity. And this region where we actually affect the flow velocity, it can be very, very thin, but we always have it. So closest to the surface of an object, viscosity will always give a small region where we have a different flow velocity than the potential flow solution. It becomes smaller and smaller the lower the viscosity is, but it will always exist. And then the other region, is the region outside where the flow is the potential flow solution. So in the region outside we can approximate as the flow looks like the potential flow solution. That's the core of the boundary layer idea. Now to talk a little bit more about the boundary layers. There are two types of them. You have laminar and turbulent boundary layers. So what we get is that the flow comes in from here, and as soon as we reach the object, we're going to start building up a boundary layer. And the boundary layer will be growing the further along we travel. Then at some point, here we have the transition, where the boundary layer becomes turbulent. And the turbulent boundary layer is a very chaotic boundary layer. So in the laminar it's ordered. In the turbulent, it's a chaos. And then in the region outside this line, we can assume it's constant flow velocity. And the point that determines where the transition is, is the Reynolds number, or it's the main component. And the Reynolds number, we define it as the flow velocity times the distance from the start of the plate divided by the kinematic viscosity. And I should mention that for an object such as a wind turbine, the big ones, is, they are going to get the turbulent boundary layer. So the limit where you get 500,000 is, it's a, it's a small scale wind turbine. Small turbines are in the laminar region, the big ones are in the turbulent region. That's about where this 500,000 will end up. Can I also mention how the shear stress correlates to this? What happens is that, well, you have this flow, the flow goes from zero up to the full velocity. And the shear stress is given by the velocity gradient. This means here that the bigger the gradient is, the higher the shear stress is. So here in the beginning, when we have a very quick region where it goes from zero to full speed, then we get a high shear stress. And then the thicker the boundary layer becomes, we get lower and lower shear stress because the velocity gradient is lower. Then when we get turbulent boundary layer, the shear stress will jump up again, and then continue to going down. So if we want to minimize the resistance from shear stress, we want to keep the boundary layer laminar as long as possible. 
Now let's talk about this transition point when the boundary layer turns turbulent. So this is affected by mainly Reynolds number. So it's approximate at 500,000. But we can change it a bit. So we can change it by how the surface of the object is. So if you have a coarse surface or high roughness, that will induce a small vortices into the flow, which will trigger this turbulence. So you can create turbulent boundary layers at much earlier than Reynolds number 500,000 if you make the surface rough. But there are limits to how long you can manage to keep the boundary layer laminar if you make it very smooth. So at some point it will still transition. The next is the pressure gradient. So it's basically that after the thickest point, when the pressure starts to increase again because the flow of velocity is decreasing. So in the beginning, flow hits an object, it will go around the object and it will get higher flow velocities. Then when it comes on the back side of the object, the flow of losses decrease again when the object becomes smaller. And that is the region where it easier turns turbulent. So for airfoils, for example, if you put the thickest point a little bit further down the airfoil, you can manage to keep the boundary layer laminar for a bit longer. So there's a whole research field about laminar airfoils, which you can lower the drag for the airfoils on. Now let's talk about the next concept, which is what will explain why we do get drag on the cylinder. And that's what's called separation. So now I have drawn a flow velocity field that is much more realistic compared to a previous potential flow case. So what we do get is that about the maximum width of the object, somewhere there, the flow could leave the object, and we have a, called the separation. So if we zoom in a little bit to that object, we have a velocity field looking like this. And what's happening is that flow comes in here, and then it can choose to leave the surface and just continue straight forward. And then we get these circulating flow fields. Now remember, the potential flow solution we used Bernoulli. But Bernoulli should be along a streamline. So if I were to use Bernoulli here, I should need to follow the streamline out here. So I cannot use Bernoulli along the surface when the flow are separated. So the Bernoulli solution collapses basically at the separation point. And then we can no longer use the Bernoulli argument to claim that we get back the pressure again behind it. So now, this separation can happen in the regions where the flow of velocity is decreasing again. So on the cylinder, it does not happen in the beginning. So here, when the flow of velocity is increasing, it will stay attached. But then when the flow of velocity is decreasing, it will separate. And where it happens, well, technically it can actually happen slightly before the thickest point, just because the flow behind it here pushes it out. But a good argument is saying that here is where we start risking flow separation. And I should also mention that this shear stress that we get from the boundary layer can actually keep it attached a bit also. So it does not have to separate when the object becomes smaller. It can, but it doesn't have to. And then the argument why we get drag well, we say it from Bernoulli. Bernoulli states that at the point here where we have the highest flow velocity, that's where we have the lowest pressure. But then when the flow lines leave, we do not get back the pressure again. Then the pressure stays low when the flow lines separate. So then we get the low pressure behind the whole region where we have separated flow. And that low pressure region is what's causing drag due to pressure. So the main argument here is that when we get flow separation, we get a drag force due to pressure. And then this will usually be the main contributing factor. 
Let's move forward. Here I have the drag force for a sphere plotted as a function of Reynolds number. What you see in the figure? First we start up here, this is really high viscosity. So up here we have a shear stress dominated flow because the viscosity is really high. Then when we come down here, we get the region where pressure dominates. And when we have a pressure dominated, we have form drag. Then it's the shape of the object that determines the drag, and drag force stays about the same. Then something happens here, and we get much lower drag for a short while. And what's that? Well, this is the point where we have transition to a turbulent boundary layer. And now you may think, doesn't turbulent boundary layers give higher shear stress? Yes, they do. But the higher shear stress also causes the flow to follow the surface much better. So when we get the high shear stress, we have, yeah, the boundary layer follows longer and we get a lower region or smaller region with low pressure. Hence, when we get turbulent boundary layers, it follows better and we get much lower force due to pressure. And this pressure is the main contribution. For us, it's actually beneficial to get the turbulent boundary layer. To give an example also about the sizes, if you take a ball with one meter diameter, let it travel at 7.6 meters per second in air, that would be Reynolds number 500,000, which we talked about for transition. Just to get a feeling about where, what is the region for when it happens. Okay, now we start to thinking. We know that we can change the position where transition happens. So here is the case when we try to make it turbulent. So for the smooth case, this is no roughness. We have this uh, curve here. This is where we got turbulent boundary layer and low drag. If we add roughness, we move the transition point earlier. Which means that we can get this low region or the real region for low drag at an earlier Reynolds number. But the negative effect is that, well, when the Reynolds number is high enough to get turbulence anyway, we will end up with a higher drag if we trigger the turbulence by roughness. I can also mention the classical example, the golf ball, this one. Golf balls are a typical case where when you hit them, they do not travel fast enough to get turbulent by themselves. But then by changing the surface of the golf ball, you make it so that you get turbulent flow around it and you get much lower drag. Which means that you will hit the golf ball much longer than if you were to use a smooth golf ball. So real golf balls fly much longer because of these dimples in them. And also to make a big sketch of how it is. The laminar case. Flow separates early, get a big region with separated flow, and we get high drag. Turbulent, it follows a bit longer, we get a smaller region, and therefore less drag. So now comes the question. How do we reduce the effects of separation? So how do we decrease the drag due to pressure? And this is where streamlining comes in. So the main idea is this. You want to keep the positive pressure gradient low. And remember the positive pressure gradient is when the flow velocity is decreasing. So how do we do this? Well, the main idea is to keep the curvature low when we have the positive pressure gradient. So this is typically after the thickest point. So now comes in the classical airfoil shape. To explain the shape, in the front we have a round shape, because we know that flow cannot separate here. Then after the thickest point we make it so it um, decreases slowly. And this will then reduce the positive pressure gradient 
and increase the chances that the flow stays attached. And that's why we have the sharp trailing edge but the round leading edge. So there's no point adding a sharp leading edge in front here. So here it should be round, here it should be sharp. If I made it sharp here, I could actually trigger separation by this sharp point directly. So for objects traveling in air, you will see this round shape, sharp edge. The objects that are sharp in the front, that's usually when you have wave drag. For example, a boat, then you will make it sharp. Or if you travel at high Mach numbers, so you get supersonic speeds, then you also make it sharp for, for wave drag. But for low Reynolds num or for low Mach numbers on airfoils, you may use them round lean leading edges. So you can compare like the shape of a submarine, the shape of an aircraft, and so on. Or even look at the shape of a fish. Then you'll see this kind of form on them. And to illustrate this for different shapes, I did a try and did a CFD simulation for four different shapes. So this is a very trivial steady state CFD simulation in ANSYS. And it had the four shapes. One airfoil shaped, one cylinder, and then two cups. One that is uh, with the opening facing the flow and one opening to the back. And what do we see? Well, this is the absolute reverse case. Then we have this cup shape here. If you turn it 180 degrees, it will be much better. So this is the phenomena you use in wind power, for example, drag-based turbines, or this cup anemometer that's measuring wind speeds. They're using that this cup has different drag depending on the shape it has, or depending on the which side of it that's facing the wind. The cylinder, well, is quite similar to the cup at the bottom. But we see that the streamlined shape, then we can almost not see any separation at all. And it doesn't change the flow velocity behind it much either. So what you can say is that the bigger area you get here, the more drag you have. Therefore, this area here has very little drag. And this one has very much. And if you want to see the streamlines, I just plotted them also. So you see that the streamlines do leave the surface for the three bottom objects, which is what's causing the separation region and the drag. But this is steady state, and the situation is not that simple. So now we're going to see a time dependent solution of the cylinder. So now I place the cylinder inside the well, channel. So watch what happens when it starts. It starts to start building up a wake behind it. Now the wake becomes unstable. And what we're going to see is um, basically an oscillating solution. So the big thing is in the beginning that's just the starting process. But after a while, this will give a periodic solution where we have a flow that is oscillating back and forth. And now we can think about what does this oscillation do? Well, if we change the flow velocity back and forth, we can expect forces due to the momentum conservation. So this will get an oscillating force on the cylinder. And this is a phenomenon that happens basically behind all objects. As soon as you get separation, you get this region where the weight behind it becomes unstable and you get an oscillating force acting on the object. So it's very good to know that these steady state solutions do not exist in reality for separated flow. You will get a flow like this. So let's leave it and talk about the lift force instead. I will start by doing the rotating cylinder. So let's add the rotation around the cylinder and now I'm showing the potential flow solution. So when it becomes 1, the rotating velocity is the same as inlet velocity. And when it becomes 2, you get zero velocity at the bottom. So if you add the rotation, 
you will curve the velocity field, and this would give a force. Because now we're changing the flow velocity. So let's take the example here. We have a rotating cylinder or a ball. It's traveling to the left. This means that it will experience an incoming wind traveling to the right if you look at in the ball's own reference system. Now we can see that on the top, the incoming flow velocity and the rotation have the same direction. This means that we get a big flow velocity if you are looking into the reference frame of the rotating object. So when you look in the moving or reference frame, you get a big velocity on the top, but at the bottom, they have opposite directions, so you get a much smaller velocity field. Now, Bernoulli's equation states that high velocity means low pressure, and low velocity means high pressure. And this gives a pressure difference between the up and down side, and we get the lift force. Another way of motivating it is that define a control volume around the object. Then we see that the flow velocity comes in at one direction, goes out at another angle. So we have changed the direction of the flow velocity. That means that we need to get the force in the opposite direction. And the more mathematical explanation to this. Well, if it lists the potential flow solution to this case, what you would have is that this term here, this is the case without any rotation. And that this extra term here is the rotating flow we added. And just to list the definition of the circulation is that you take the line integral around the object. And now, without any derivation, I'm just going to give you the explanation. You will get a lift force, and this is kutta jukovskis lift formula. And that states that the lift force is, well, L is the length of the cylinder, density is the density of the fluid, gamma is the circulation, and V0 is the velocity, or the incoming flow velocity. If you want to show this, you should set up a nullis equation around the cylinder and integrate the flow field. That's when you get this one. So what we see is that the lift force is directly proportional to the circulation you can get around the cylinder. And you will get this due to when the cylinder is rotating due to friction, it will, the flow will start rotating with it. But these are the main factors. Linear to the velocity V0, the circulation, and the length of the cylinder. Then of course the circulation will have a more complicated behavior how much we get. Okay, so now let's take another object and see what happens to it. I will take the sail. And now I'm going to demonstrate it with a simple paper. So first it's a very classic example. You take the object paper and blow underneath it. The paper lifts up. No surprise to anyone, I guess. The air will just push it up. But what happens if you blow on top of it? The paper lifts up in this case as well. How can we explain that? Why did the paper lift when I blew on top of it? And it did lift when I blew underneath it. Well, let's look at the flow lines. The flow comes in, curves around the airfoil. We change the direction of the flow, we get the lift force up. And the same thing happens when I was blowing on top of the paper. The air tends to follow the surface of the paper, which basically causes the air to curve down and it will lift up the paper. So it doesn't matter if the flow went underneath the paper or above it. Both cases change the flow velocity to point more downward, and we got the force pointing upwards. So basically air follows and we get to change the direction. The explanation is directly from Newton's laws. So this is the main concept about lift force. We should basically change the direction of the incoming flow velocity. So we turn the incoming flow velocity 
and then we get the lift force. So let's continue and talk about the wings instead. First, I'm going to give the definition. We add in the line parallel to the flow velocity. We add in the chord line. And then we define the angle of attack as the angle between these two. So this is the angle of attack alpha. It's the angle between the wind direction and the chord line of the airfoil. Now let's continue with an example. And now I'm going to show you the potential flow solution for the wing. The first case will be without any circulation. So now I'm changing this angle of attack. And watch what happens to the flow lines. So these blue lines represent the direction of the flow velocity. So they're called streamlines. Notice that the flow starts looking quite weird down here. The flow is coming in, making a 180 degree turn and going up here and here it leaves. This does not look very realistic, does it? The flow will not do a 180 degree turn in reality. So now comes the Kutta condition. So the idea behind this condition is that to make the flow field realistic, we should add the circulation to the airfoil to make it so that the flow velocity in the upper and lower side of the airfoil at the trailing edge should be the same. So now I add in more circulation and see that I curve the flow lines. And when I get that the flow lines go straight out from the trailing edge, then I'm happy. So here now I see that now the flow line leaves in straight lines. And this looks much more realistic. Because now they're not doing this 180 degree turn, which is completely unfiscal. So the whole motivation is that this is the only circulation that will not give this 180 degree turn, which would give an infinite acceleration. So this is the way to get rid of that mathematical problem. Hence, it should be like this. And this is actually a very good model. So potential flow for airfoils has given good results. So now let's look at it again, but now I'm adding the circulation to always match the angle. So now I'm getting, and you can see that the more I change the angle of attack, the more I'm curving the flow lines. But now it starts looking a bit too much, right? This does not look realistic that we can get this much or that we can get these flow lines. Because now it's um, looking very weird here at the top instead. So we'll soon come into the problem of what we should do about this. But I want to mention first though that the circulation is proportional to sinus of the angle of attack. And for small angles of attack, we can say that sinus is approximately just the angle of attack. So basically, this theory states that the lift coefficient should vary linearly with angle of attack. And the slope of that curve is 2 pi, if it's a thin airfoil. This you can prove mathematically. But it's for a more advanced video. And then you have this CL0, which is which lift coefficient you have at zero angle of attack, which is for more advanced airfoils. Okay, but now I'm going to talk about what is the problem with this 35 degree angle of attack case. Because this will not happen in reality. And now, now comes the concept of stall. So for low angles of attack, the flow lines will follow the surface. But if we make the angle of attack too high, we will get separation, just as what happened to the cylinder. So stall, that means that we make the angle of attack so high that we get flow separation. And then we get this flow behind the airfoil with all this turbulence. And we know what this means, right? If you get this flow field, 
you get a high drag. Because now you get pressure drag on the airfoil. And that is something you do not want. So to illustrate this, I did make a simple animation again. And now we're going to see an airfoil that is pitching up and down. So it starts at a low angle attack. It will slowly decrease its angle attack. And now you can start to see some tendencies of separation close to the back of the airfoil. And soon we're going to see real separation. So now it starts to separate all the way at the leading edge or at the front of the airfoil. And now you'll also start to see this oscillating flow behind the airfoil. So when we stall the airfoil, we're going to get oscillating forces on the airfoil. Now the simulation has started pitching down again. And I want you to watch at what happens with the separated flow. It will actually stay separated a lot longer or for much lower angles of attack when it goes down than what it had when it was going up. And this is a delay in the separation. This phenomenon is also called dynamic stall. Is that when you're pitching up the blade, the flow will stay attached for a little bit longer before it has time to separate. And that you can see now again when it's pitching up. That the flow is staying attached for angles that it was very well separated when it was pitching down. And this is also a concept that will make the flow around airfalls basically a bit more complicated. So I wanted to know that the flow around airfalls is a very complicated topic. And there's a lot of phenomena to consider. The most important part here is to know about what is stall. You should know that stall happens at a high angles attack. It gives slow separation. And that gives oscillating force on the blade. Then it's good to know that you have these dynamic effects. And then when it's moving, it behaves quite different from when it's static. So, let's move on. I also want to mention the rain loss number here as well. So what we usually get for airfoils, if we increase the rain loss number, it usually means lower viscosity or if we go up in size. Airfoils usually behave better when we have high rain loss numbers. And we can clearly see it here. This is for the Naka 0021 airfoil. So that we get, for a high rain loss number, we get a much higher lift coefficient than the low rain loss number case. And we also see that this airfoil stalls at angle about 9 degrees. This one stalls at about 12, 13 degrees. Here we are up about 15 degrees before it stalls. So high Reynolds number is good for the airfoil performance. So you get stall later, you usually get lower drag and more lift. And this for wind turbines, it makes it so that it's easier to get good performance of a wind turbine if you make it big. Because then you are operating at high Reynolds number. And then, yeah, good blade performance. I also want to mention these airfoil shapes. Because I think most people think about this when they think about an airfoil. That you have a curved upper here, a bit flatter underneath. This is a cambered airfoil. Well, at least this was a symmetric one. So what happens if you use a cambered airfoil? Well, a symmetric one, it looks the same independent on which direction you pitched in. So it's a, if you go to negative angles of attack, well, you get the negative lift coefficient, but it's uh, symmetric around the zero point. If you use a cambered airfoil, you will have some lift force at zero angle of attack. So at zero angle of attack, you will be up here, but you will have the, exactly the same slope. It's still about 2 pi, this slope. Then what can happen here? The reason you want to use cambered airfoils, well, you can get a higher 
angle of attack before stall if you design your camber air fairly well. And it can also be possible to get air falls that get lower drag. So you can get better performance from the cambered air falls. But this is higher or corrections. Basically, they all both are linear. And it's just a shift, so basically an offset in the angle of attack. But what you want is that you want this. If you can get a little bit higher lift coefficient, then you want to go for cambered. That can be beneficial then. Now, as a final topic, you're going to mention the wingtip vortices. So, if you have an airplane, underneath the wings, you're going to get a high pressure. And above, you can have a low pressure. This is needed to lift the plane up. But what happens at the wingtip? If you have a flow like this, high pressure here, low pressure here. We know that flow wants to move from high pressure to low pressure. And then at the wingtip, there's a shorter path to take, and that's going around the wingtip. So the flow can sneak around the wingtip. And this is what will, what will cause the wingtip vortices. And then you'll get two big vortices behind an airplane. And you will always have these vortices. And if you want to know how, how big they are, you can actually get it from the kutta yukovsky lift formula. So it's very easy to prove mathematically that circulation is conserved. Basically that vorticity is a divergence-free field. Which means that the circulation of the tip vortex is exactly the same as the circulation you have around your blade that is generating the lift force. So if you have a high circulation around your wing, you get a big tip vortex. And you will always have them. So this is mathematically strict. You will have to have, the, that circulation will have to go somewhere and that is into the tip vortex. So how do we explain it? Well, we have an airfoil. And then assume that this is the velocity from the plane. So the air force is an incoming velocity. Now these tip vortices, they will cause a flow going down. And that is called the induced velocity. So this vort just the vortex shape will push flow down. The other, another argument for why the flow goes down is that if you want to generate the lift force, you have to push flow down to conserve momentum. So just from the momentum equation, you can also say that you must push flow down to get the lift force up. So the induced velocity is just the velocity needed to keep the plane flying, to overcome the gravity loss. Okay, let's add these vectors together. Then we get a relative wind vector. Now we should know that the lift force is 90 degrees to the wind vector. And that is the relative wind vector. So you get a lift force 90 degree to this one. And then we can divide this into two components. And one component is acting in the same direction as the flow velocity. And this is the drag direction. So therefore, this part of the lift vector that's pointing backwards. That's what we call the induced drag. And I will talk a bit more about the induced drag in the blade element momentum video. So this was just an introduction, because it is also an important concept for wind turbines. So this was the final concept for this uh, introduction to aerodynamics. And in the blade element momentum model video, we'll talk a lot more about it. Thank you.